Hi everybody, it's um, John back again with another model in box of you. If you're looking at this aircraft and you know exactly what it is, then well done. <laughs> but uh, probably a lot of people have no idea what this aircraft is. Um, but it has two very interesting claims to fame. One of them is to do with the realm of um, US Army Air Force and US Naval Service. And the other one is to do with the movie business. This uh, aircraft is actually a Boeing P-12E. Um, and the Boeing P-12 was actually manufactured by Boeing in two completely separate versions, utilising the same airframe, but um, having a slightly reinforced undercarriage uh, for the US Navy under the designation the Boeing F-4B. Um, the majority of naval aircraft are actually F-4B-4 variants and it was the F-4B-4 um, that became one of the most successful, that's not 100% true, it was the first all metal stressed tubular framed um, aircraft um, to be in operational service with both the US Army and the US Navy. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if the fabric control surfaces were covered in fa uh, sorry if the fa if the control surfaces were covered in fabric but I'm pretty sure the rest of the aircraft was actually um, metal skinned and as such it was a very uh, reliable and very versatile high really really strong aircraft used by the Navy that actually started life as a US pursuit aircraft for the United States Army Air Force now, the claim to fame that this particular aircraft has in the movie business is that in 1936 they made a film called King Kong in black and white, and the original old King Kong film um, that was released in black and white. At the end of that movie, everyone knows the the fabulous. Um, I mean, if you've ever if you've not seen the original 1936 version, go and watch it because it's fabulous. Um, but at the end of the film, obviously King Kong gets shot down off the top of the Empire State Building. Well, the US aircraft that were used to um, shoot him down from the top of the tower were actually Boeing F-4B-4s. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why this company produced this particular kit in 172nd scale. But we'll just go straight into it. Now, obviously, the company that we're looking at um, is one very dear to my heart and this is Matchbox. Now Matchbox released this kit originally in 1972 as part of the initial aircraft range of kits in their purple range. Um, this was PK3, the Boeing P-12E in 172nd scale. Now the initial release kits, uh, the Type 1 boxes, if you like, from Matchbox, they had flip-top lids. They didn't open up at one end. Um, they usually had two variants covered in the kit, and the the plan, the, the paint plan and decal guide was on the back of the box. Um, so they were actually very, very cleverly utilising the, the way in which the box incorporated lots of things that you needed to do and also encompass the box the kit and com uh, was encompassed by the box itself now the Boeing P12E as I said was released in 1972 it was part of their initial 19 kits range in that year um, and the way you can tell a type 1 box 72 release is obviously a flip top lid but it also has this two color kit logo above the wing of the Boeing P12E here in in, uh, in black, two colour kit logo, there it is. Now in every other variant, the uh, the two colour kit insignia is down here in the bottom left hand corner, except for the last rendition, which we'll get to in a minute. So that's the 1972 release. Um, the next box that came into service was the 1974 Type 2 release, and here we go again, the two colour kit logo has been brought down to the bottom left hand corner and you have an open ended box um, they did away with the flip top lid boxes and you ended up with an open ended box 
at one end and this is the type 2 that they're quite rare the type 2 kits are quite rare this bright red logo two color kit circular logo is actually um, a, a really good indication of that you've got a type 2 box and these are, they're quite collectible and these are the ones that tend to fetch more money than any of the others uh, 1974 went on to 1975 and this is the most common boxing that you can get of this kit it's what's classed as a Type 3, 75 release, and they changed the colours to a red and white and black um, embossed <coughs> style two-colour kit logo here. But everything else about the box is exactly the same as previous offerings. Um, so that's 1975, and then you go into the final rendition of this kit, which was released in 1982. But it was also released in 1992 with a... An absolutely identical box. The kit was taken off the market, I think, in the mid 1980s, um, and released in 1992 uh, by the market um, ownership of Ravel. Now, when Ravel took over this kit <clears throat> in 1992, they they hadn't got round to the the practice of taking the two colour kit. Uh, sprues out of the models and replace them with single colours which is fantastic because I think Ravel dropped this kit uh, in about 1994 which was when they started going over to the single colours and I think the the fact that you can't seem to get a later generation model in the 92 kit um, from Matchbox of the Boeing P12E um, would suggest the fact that they dropped the kit before they went over to single colour sprues um, this is a Type 4 boxing, and the way you can tell a Type 4 boxing is it still retains the two colour kit sprues, but you go with this black border with the matchbox symbol brought down into the bottom left hand corner of the box, and I believe this is a flip top lid. I believe that when uh, Ravel started getting hold of matchbox, they reintroduced the flip top lids into quite a lot of their ranges, and this lovely, fiery, flashy three colour trim here that this flag trim here which is quite nice as well now this is actually the subject of the kit that I've got um, which is quite interesting we'll, we'll have a look at the plastic and the kit when we have a look at the inbox of you section of this uh, video now then <clears throat> I want to leave you a nice image now of the Boeing P12E and this is actually for pretty similar to the, the variant of the kit that you get in the boxing um, in the Matchbox kit. But before we go into the options and costs, I just want to reiterate the fact that the naval version is the F4B and it's exactly the same plane. It just has reinforced undercarriage um, to enable it to um, be used for the Navy for deck landings. Um, but that's the only difference between the aircraft and that is why I've included the F4B variants of model releases from different companies in this options and cost inbox review because it, it is actually the same aircraft. So what we'll do is we'll just pan the camera down onto the table so we can have a quick look at this kit. This is PK3, the third model in their purple range, which was the 72nd scale model aircraft range. <clears throat> All you matchbox lovers out there, I'm trying to get this um, camera to sort itself out. There we go. Sorry about the, the wobbly camera view. But that should, oops, there we go. That, that's a bit better, isn't it? There we go. Still not having it, is it? I'm gonna have to invest in a better stand because this stand is a bit of a mare. Right. <clears throat> so what we have is the kit box here. This is the initial Revell uh, marketing of the Matchbox model. And you've still got two color sprues here, which is great. Um, on the back of the kit, You've got the colour guide, the two variants here, they're both Army Pursuit Aircraft, the United States Army Air Force. Um, this is the one, I do believe that they've got a model of this in flying condition in, in America somewhere. The other one is actually in a museum, um, but it was opera, obviously an operational aircraft. Uh, well, they were both operational aircraft for the United States Army Air Force. Um, so that's the colour guide on the back, which is nice. And you've also got a nice image here of what the aircraft will look like, built up without any paint, which was a trait of uh, Matchbox. They always showed you the image on the side, which was really nice. And we'll just open the box up. 
open ended box here, as, as you can obviously tell. We'll just pop those down on one side and we'll get everything out. And I'll try and show you this baby in all of its glory because it's actually a really nice little kit. Very nice little kit. So, <clears throat> first of all, the instruction leaflet. Now, with early renditions of Purple Range kits, um, as with all their different various ranges, uh, colour ranges that is, Matchbox always produced the instruction leaflet in the colour of the, the model range. So this being a purple range kit, in the earlier renditions of, of the boxings you'll get a purple instruction leaflet inside and it's almost a bluey sort of red. Um, it's, it's quite a really deep purple with reddish colour. But in the later renditions, I think around about Type 3 to Type 4, and this, the, in this rendition especially, all the instruction leaflets turned to white like this. They were all white, very easy to um, photocopy and you know, manufacture, and I think that's the reason why they went over to white um, instructions. The instruction leaflet itself seems to fold down into A5. On the front you've got some information, gumph and stats on the aircraft itself and a nice image re repeat of what's on the front cover of the box. And then you've got some stats here um, on the aircraft and some assemb the assembly and montage and all the rest of it. And then you open up the, the leaflet and before I go on to the instruction part itself I just want to show you what you get on the back. You've got a colour call out here on the very left hand side and these are all the different colours. Now they are actually um, giving you uh, the matchbox range colour guides but they're also giving you the airfix numbers um, when applicable. For instance trainer yellow um, colour A which is 24 and matchbox is actually the airfix M15 um, and other colours there, M13, M7 Flesh, M23 Leather, they're all re referenced to airfix colours um, from around about the 70s period and there's quite a lot of guides and charts that you can have a look at online to actually see what the, the different colour options that they suggest you do in say the Tami acrylics or um, the Humbrol enamel range which is quite nice and also at the side and the bottom of here you've got a built-in complaint slip into the instruction leaflet which you can send off to Matchbox for any bits that you had missing. Obviously it's a waste of time sending off to Matchbox now the company's been gone for nearly 30 years now. Um, you've also got a nice little guide in the middle page here with various pictures um, and letters attached to them. These are the paint guides to paint the various parts before you assemble them as you go through the assembly procedure and it's nice that Air Matchbox gave you this guide because um, for people who wanted to paint the aircraft it was, a, it was a nice touch that Matchbox did. And We'll turn the instruction leaflet over. The kit actually builds up in eight stages which is quite a lot actually for Matchbox models. Normally they're built up in five, four or five stages but the P12E is actually quite a complicated build. Um, in section one, you're painting the pilot and the seat. Uh, sorry, you're, you're assembling the pilot and the seat. In section two, you're basically putting the airframe around the, the interior detail. Um, there's not a lot of detail in this kit, as you can see, but to be honest with you, you can't see much past the pilot through that aperture anyway. Section three, you're putting the upper decking with the machine guns and the uh, fuselage support struts for the upper wing. Now, an interesting thing about this particular method of construction is that this is a repeat from PK-1 of Hawker Fury, which a lot of pro builders and reviewers suggested was one of the easiest biplane models you'll ever build. Because basically what you do is you assemble parts 5 and 6, which are those fuselage support struts for the upper wing, and then you fit them into part 7, which is the machine gun and upper decking section to the upper fuselage. And then you literally lay that whole assembly to dry, set it all aside to dry, um, and then obviously you move on to section four, which is a tail impenage. And whilst you're going through the other sections, leading up to section eight, this assembly will be completely dry and set hard as rock. And then what you do is you fix the upper wing to parts five and six, and that forms the jig plan to put the interplane struts, which is in section six F, parts 15 and 31. And you basically fit them in exactly the same way that you did with the uh, Hawker Fury kit. And I did explain this in the inbox review that I did for the Hawker Fury model last year. 
basically all you do is you glue the um, the holes in the upper wing here or rather here in section 7 you glue the holes here and here and then you glue these two parts here and here forget about what it's telling you in the instruction leaflet do this in this order at point of point 7 because you'll already have this part glued in place in point 7 and then you let this all dry and then you glue these two parts together here. But you glue the bottom struts first and fit them into place. And then you glue these holes in the top of the wing. And then you just slip the interplane strut into its location holes. It's clean, it's very easy, and it's idiot proof. Because what you're left with is an absolute rock solid jigged out piece of kit that the model actually jigs for you. Forget about all of this lining the struts up because you can't line these struts up without the upper wing in place. And why, why worry about lining all this up and then setting it off to hard to dry when you can do it all in one go at figure 7 there? It's much easier to do that. And in actual fact, if you look online and look at some of the pro builders' reviews of this kit and a lot of other manufacturers of different scales of the P12 and the F4B, they actually do suggest you do this and you don't follow the instructions by pre-aligning all the struts because it's just a complete waste of time. So then when you put the tail impenage in place in section 4, that's quite easy. You've got two little support struts under the tail plates there, parts 21 doubled up. And then you've got the engine assembly. Now, the engine assembly was a Wright's R1340. I think it was a nine-cylinder radial piston engine. And... Apparently the Matchbox rendition of this engine is really accurate. It's actually very accurate indeed. Um, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of the pro builders like the Matchbox kit. And we'll get into that when I go through the conclusions and everything. But basically they're saying that the kit is, is relatively cheap and cheerful to acquire. It's an easy build. It's very well engineered to fit together correctly. And it's actually very good shape um, overall and the engine is particularly good it's a particularly good well shaped and crafted engine it's very very good indeed um, and it looks nice on the aircraft as well so some of you guys out there who like to mess around with washes and metallic paint and getting me metal aspects to the plastic engine you'd have a field day with this very very nice so section six you basically put in the struts in place but i would do those at section seven um, and they're telling you to line it all up as well and also you've got the uh the gun sight which is part 16 there uh, sorry 14 there and then you've got the windshield um and when you see the windshield on this kit it's, it's really nice it's tiny but it's really nice and then in section eight you're basically finishing off with the undercarriage trestle putting the cowlings on the engine the bomb armament and there's a secondary interplane strut which links the upper and lower ailerons. Um, and that is a nice little feature as well of the kit too. One of the other interesting things is, is that before you fit part 13, and it is very clearly labelled in the instruction, which is one of the engine cowls, you have to put the engine exhaust... Um, is it the exhaust or is it the inlet manifold? I can never remember. I think it might even be the inlet manifold from the fuel tank. Um, part 28 and you fit that into part 13 the engine cowl before you put the engine cowl onto part 12 and fit it around the engine cylinders very very easy to do but if you forget to do this at this point it becomes a complete and utter nightmare the model itself comes with a couple of bomb armament um, which is optional you don't have to put that those on the u.s army air force pursuit fighter usually didn't have those fitted so that's the instruction leaflet it's quite easy to follow the decals <clears throat> the decals on this kit are very similar to most other matchbox decals the part the, the decal sheet itself is actually quite good um, this is a later rendition so the quality of the decals will be slightly improved over the original matchbox release uh, decals but I think you'll find that the decals themselves are, are identical to this. It might be just the backing film quality that's improved because some of the earlier renditions of the decal sheets, they didn't look as good as this, which is a shame. But yeah, they didn't quite look as good as this. But that's the decal sheet. The actual register on the roundels there are quite nice. Um, <clears throat> not sure how those uh, rudder flashes will go on, whether you'll have a nasty, horrible edge at the edge. But uh, 
I might have to use those because I'm I can't see me being able to produce as good a set of red and white uh, stripes as that. Um, but the actual backing film it looks quite clear and the decals themselves they're not too raised. Oh, they're, they're very thin actually. That's actually really nice. They're very thin. So that's the decal sheet. The decal sheet looks quite good. Then we'll have a look at. Oops. Just drop the uh, wind the windscreen. Sorry about that. Then we'll have a look at the windscreen. <clears throat> It's quite good that the uh, the screw the windshield is on is a shape that I can hold because when the camera comes into this you can see how crystal clear that windshield is. I'm hoping it's going to focus all right. It doesn't look like it's going to, which is a shame. But that windshield is really clear. It's very nicely crafted and the frame on it should paint up very nice. So that should be quite good too. Quite impressed with that. We'll do the yellow sprue first. Um, not a lot to write home about this. It's very typical of Matchbox parts on sprues. There's no flash, there's no burrs, no tabs, no nothing. That it, it should be just a matter of trimming the parts off, cleaning them up, painting them up maybe if needed to, and then pop them onto the, the airframe. No issues whatsoever. But the actual quality of these parts, I mean, you've got to remember, this was released in 1972. Can you see the ribbing on that top wing? It's really nicely done and it's not overdone, but it's done enough to make you see the shadows inside the riblets, which is really nice. The actual, the, the, the frames, do you know, I'm not 100% sure whether this thing was stressed metal. Looking at the photograph I've got in front of me on the computer of this P12E, that upper and lower wing does look like it's riveted. There are sections of it riveted together. But the, the model parts make out that it looks like it could possibly be fabric covered and doped. Although, no, actually, do you know what it is? If you look at the upper wing there, you can see now, the upper wing's fabric control surfaces of the ailerons there, you can see the fabric control, uh, fabric covered ailerons and the, the stressed metal skin, nice and tight. It's a very, it's definitely a different texture. So the aircraft was completely metal stress skinned as well. It's a completely metal aircraft. The parts are very nice. There's the traditional matchbox pilot. Don't know what I'll call him yet. Probably, um, probably Hank. That's a nice American name, isn't it? The wheel detail, not much to home, uh, write home about, but it's okay, isn't it? You know, it's quite nicely defined. The bombs are okay. The propeller's not bad. The propeller's quite nicely moulded actually, it's quite clean and very nice, so I'm quite pleased with that sprue. And this is the complicated sprue with lots of parts on it. <clears throat> I just want to show you this engine. Um, the engine itself is really nicely crafted as you can see and the definition on those cylinders is quite nice too. Uh, 1972 rendition, yeah quite pleased with that. That is easily as good as the engine that you get in the Airfix Bulldog which is exceptional. Um, that's very nice. I'm quite impressed with that. You've got um, all the uh, the pipe leads. That's, I think that's the inlet man, inlet manifold that goes at the back of the engine, which is nice. Pilot seat, it's the top um, decking for the fuselage, and then you've got all these extra interplane struts, support struts for the wing and the cowling. I think that's a fuel tank of some sort. And the other struts that go in place on the aircraft and the trestle undercarriage. Even the detail on the actual trestle support for the undercarriage is quite nice as well. As you can see there, it's just coming nicely into focus. It's a nicely detailed, nicely finished model. I really, really like the look of this kit. I've never built the Matchbox uh, P12. So I'm looking forward to getting my hands on this kit and getting it built. Um, the interior details, as I said before, like all Matchbox kits, it's pretty bereft of detail and interior features. But, but I'll be honest with you, you're not going to see an awful lot through there at all, are you? The other side's pretty much the same as well. But this kit does have a floor pan for the pilot, which is nice too. And then you've got the features um, of the actual fuselage. The fuselage on this kit is quite short and quite angularly de uh, designed. Um, but the features on the aircraft, you can see them, they're rendered beautifully there's a nice set of rivets in the tail section there and they're not overdone um, which is quite nice I'm trying to get the camera to there but there we go they're not overdone they're actually pretty nice you might need a tiny tiny little bit of sand but I wouldn't go overboard with it because 
The features on this kit are nicely detailed and the pro builders and reviewers are absolutely right about this. This kit is nicely finished. Um, the other side of the fuselage there is pretty much a carbon copy of the other side and it's nice. I like the look of these parts in this kit. Very nice indeed. So that's the parts. <clears throat> the parts uh, the parts look good. Free of flash as usual with Matchbox. You know, you never used to get flash in Matchbox kits. Um, and if there were some it was very few and far between. The kit looks very nicely rendered. I'm very much looking forward to having a bash at this. What we'll do, we'll just put the kit box, everything back into the box so I know where everything is and it's all packed away. And I'll leave you a nice image there of the kit. And we'll just go through the gump because the gump is quite interesting. Um, right, the, the inbox review is actually on the Matchbox Boeing P12V. Its serial number is PK3 and its release date was 1972 and it, it was moulded in 172nd scale. There are decals for two versions. The first is an aircraft from the 95th Attack Squadron, the United States Army Air Force. And the second is of the 27th Pursuit Squadron, 1st Pursuit Group, United States Army Air Force. The dimensions of the kit are roughly three and a quarter inches long by about a span of five inches. And it should sit about one and a half inches high on its undercarriage. There are 22 parts on one green plastic sprue. 15 parts on a yellow plastic sprue and one clear part, totaling 38 parts. The options and costs are quite interesting, and I've included the options for both the Boeing P-12V, which was the US Army Air Force aircraft, and for the F-4B, which was the naval version. Um, now, one 700 scale, there's a company called um, Tom's Model Works, and they produce a Boeing P-12V and also a Boeing F-4B-4 in 1-700 scale. And these kits are generally transparent. I think I've featured quite a few of these uh, styles of models. Um, and they're, they're, they're actually made in a form of 3D printing, um, which is quite interesting. And the kits actually end up being transparent, but they're very, very good replicas in 1-700 scale. And when they're painted up, they look really good. I have seen quite a lot of um, different types of models in 1700 scale painted up, and they do look exceptional. They're not as good a overall form, air airframe form, as, say, a, a larger scale kit, but they do represent, and they do look like what they're supposed to look like. And obviously they're intended for the guys who like diorama bases for 1700 scale ships and having a few aircraft in the foreground. Um, AHM build a Boeing F4B4 and 187th scale. This kit retails for about £23 to £25. In 172nd scale, obviously you've got quite a few here, Accurate Miniatures do um, a reboxing of the monogram kit of the Boeing F4B4 and the Curtis Hawk P6, which is a double kit in one box. This retails for between £13 and £25. Esoteric do a Boeing F4B1 stroke 2. I think that's in two different boxings. This kit retails for between £40 and £50 and it's quite rare, but I do warn you it's quite dire as well. It's not a good kit. Uh, Matchbox obviously do the Boeing P12E. This kit retails from anything from £5 to £16 upwards. Uh, Monogram do the Boeing F4B4. They also do um, the double kit that Accurate Miniatures did as well as a Boeing offering, but that one is very, very rare and very difficult to get hold of. And I haven't got a pricing on the double kit, but the single kit of the F4B4 is available from anything from four, five pounds, sorry, to fifteen pound. Monogram's three fighter planes kit, which is a bit more easier to get hold of than the double plane kit, it's called Fighting Planes of the 1930s, comprises an F4B4 a Curtis P6E Hawk and a Grumman F11C2 Goss Hawk and these kits retail for about 20 to 30 pounds. Now Pro Resin also build a Boeing P12B and a P12D. These are resin kits. Um, I'm not sure whether they have injection molded features but I think the main airframes are made of resin and I've got no details um, on price on that. I'm, I'm sorry about that but I haven't. 148 scale, Aurora build a Boeing F4B4. This kit retails for about 45 to 55 pound. Classic Airframes build a Boeing F4B4 for 30 to 40 pound. Entex Industries build a Boeing F4B4 for 19 to 50 pounds. And Fuji 
build a Boeing F4B4. Uh, again, I've got no pricing available on that kit. And there's a company called KMB Models who produce a Boeing F4B4, which is a reboxed Aurora kit. And that model's available for between five and forty-five pounds. Now, you can also get um, one of each of the Army and the Naval variants um, in one thirty-second from Hasegawa. Uh, the P12V is the cheapest one to, to get your hands on if you hold out for a price, and it can often be picked up for as little as seven pounds to up up to about forty to forty-four pounds. The Boeing F4B4 is a little bit more pricey, but it is principally the same kit. Um, it retails for between fifteen and forty-five pound. Now the conclusions. As with all Matchbox kits, this model is pretty basic, but it is to a certain degree praised by the pro builders as being a reasonable replica and easy to assemble as the top wing can be glued in place onto the fuselage struts and the interplane struts can then be slipped into place after the top wing is dry. There is limited detail in the cockpit but you won't see anything past the pilot anyway and the airframe and the engine especially appears to be of good shape. Avoid the kits by Esoteric in 72nd scale as they are very expensive and they're not really very good. Aurora, Entex and KMB options in 148th. Well, yeah, they're pretty dire and they're pretty pricey as well. The best options would probably be AHM for an 87th scale kit, though these kits are pretty expensive too. The Monogram and the Matchbox offerings in 172nd scale these two offerings are very much prized and pra sorry praised by the pro builders, um, and the classic airframes model in 48 scale is also a highly praised kit, but it is um, incorporating resin parts and it isn't an easy build. The best praised kit by pro modelers in any scale is the Hasegawa models in 132nd scale, as they are real gems. And they can sometimes be picked up for as little as five to ten pound if you hold out for a bargain. Um, <clears throat> so that's the inbox review. I hope this video has been of some use. The Matchbox kit, I, I would thoroughly recommend the Matchbox kit. It's actually nicely moulded. It's a good shape, plan form and everything. And I think it, it would be an enjoyable build. Especially to you guys out there who like rigging. Because there's quite a lot of rigging to do on this model. Um, so, yeah, as I said before, I hope the video has been of some use. I hope all your modelling projects are going smooth. And um, let's just have fun out there. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.